niche type thing. Uh, calculating relative landscape position, landform classification, uh, certainly uh, things related to, to um, topographic position, uh, sediment transport index, the topographic index, those type of common terrain analysis type stuff. Uh, one of my passions is LIDAR. I'm very happy to see that airborne laser scanning is a, a real theme in this in this uh, conference and that a lot of people have certainly started to pick up this data. And so uh, there is in fact a, a LIDAR toolbox that's a component of, of Whitebox. It's used for uh, interpolating LAS files, LAS files being the binary, the specialized binary data formats that LiDAR data are usually distributed as because it's such dense data. So there's lots of routines there for dealing with this type of uh, specialized data, looking at the point return, looking at the intensity of the return, and so on and so forth, for both creating digital elevation models, processing those DEMs, and as well for canopy modeling, taking the off-terrain objects like trees and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> certainly you can interpolate LAS files into, into regular raster grids, you can mosaic those together, you can fill missing data holes despite the fact that the previous slide said they have missing data holes, you can, you can certainly um, remove those areas of no data, you can remove off-terrain objects, you can model uh, vegetation canopy, so it's uh, fairly sophisticated when it comes to, to LiDAR data processing. Here's an example of one of the uh, interpolators for LiDAR data. These things really are designed specifically, so unlike uh, the general IDW interpolator in, in white box, this one is quite specifically for last file input. You can, for example, interpolate, uh, you see the default here is for the elevation, which you normally want to do. You can also interpolate the, the uh, intensity data, you can interpolate the scan angle, all sorts of things like that. You can use all the returns as it's set up here, or you can use the first returns or just the last returns if you want to get something closer to the bare earth digital elevation model. Uh, and then you can also exclude points based on classifications if those points are there. So you can exclude all of the all of the um, vegetation points. You can exclude the bridges and things like that if such things have been have been um, incorporated in the last data set itself. So fairly fairly specific for, for that type of data and uh, extremely powerful as well. There's, as I said, algorithms for removing off-terrain objects and therefore for mapping off-terrain objects. Here's LiDAR in, a, uh, in, a, in an urban environment. I'm not entirely sure if you can consider Ridgetown an urban, but they might think so. So we'll call it urban, uh, where you have obviously uh, uh, houses and, and larger sized buildings. You can then remove those, and of course, you can remove them, and you can actually also model the buildings themselves. So that can be done. Uh, <clears throat> Whitebox is, from the outset, designed to handle really large, particularly raster data. Obviously, it handles vector data as well, as I've already said. But in terms of raster data, I've always found it quite frustrating that data sets keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. LiDAR is certainly no exception there. Uh, we're ever using ever more extensive data sets. I know someone is trying to process a 30 meter DEM of Australia and ever finer data sets as well. So here's an example of a, uh, of a actually a LiDAR digital elevation model that was created by Mosaic in 4,200 separate square kilometer LiDAR tiles. The thing itself is about four and a quarter billion grid cells it's about 16 gigabytes in size. You can very easily open this file. You can zoom in, zoom out, uh, interact with the data uh, um, quite well, despite the, the size of that particular raster. There's also a very extensive hydrology toolbox for performing uh, surface hy hydrological analysis, things like uh, flow path enforcement, and depression filling, depression breaching, or channeling. Lots of different flow algorithms. One of the things that drives me nuts is the lack of, of different algorithm or, or options for performing the same type of analysis in open source and closed source GIS. There are lots of different ways of performing flow analysis. You as a user should have the right to figure out which one is most appropriate for your application. So for this particular type of thing, you'll see that there's the of course D8, F8, D infinity, and M D infinity flow algorithms incorporated in white box. You decide which is most appropriate for your application. Uh, flow path, uh, length analysis, watershed delineation, sub-basin delineation, hill slope mapping, that type of thing. Uh, the, one of the earlier talks, Xavier, was, was quite interesting. He was showing how with LiDAR data, if you don't handle uh, the pre-processing step appropriately, you can pretty much completely mess up the, the um, stream path mapping 
kind of slow learn mapping. Uh, so here's the example of depression filling. As you can see, it, it does truly mess up. You can see this is what it should look like. It completely created this artificial lake behind, lake behind this um, uh, road embankment. With the advanced depression breaching algorithm, which uses a, a least uh, impact type of approach for, for finding the optimum route, it's basically carved out the path that likely there's a culvert in in terms of the road embankment. The result is a, a much, much improved flow path um, uh, throughout this wider DNA. Stream network analysis, so if you have then extracted a stream network, you probably want to do something with it. Uh, at least most fluvial geomorphologists are quite interested in that sort of thing. So there's lots there in terms of mapping the stream network itself, different algorithms for, for example, figuring out where those darn channel heads might well lie, um, for mapping streams themselves, for uh, then interrogating the geometry of the map stream network, like link length and slope analysis, stream order, and using various techniques like, of course, trailer stream order, but also things like hack stream order, uh, topological order, and so on and so forth. Uh, longitudinal profiles, uh, link classification, again, unless you're a fluvial geomorphologist, you do not get overly excited about those capabilities, but they're there. Uh, in terms of remote sensing, there are, I think, something like 32 different uh, spatial filters that can be performed in, in white box, all of which will allow you to change the dimension of the filter for any arbitrary size filter, any arbitrary shaped filter, so you can change the X and Y dimension, you can make them round filters or, or rectangular filters, you can have it reflect in the edges or not reflect in the edges, lots and lots of different functionality there. Uh, contrast stretching, of course, for, for imagery, change detection algorithms if you have multispectral type data, uh, principal component analysis, inverse principal component analysis, uh, image classification, feature space, space, space plotting, uh, and uh, uh, recently I've added a photogrammetry toolbox that will allow for uh, pixel matching and, and some basic um, mm -hmm. photogrammetric type analyses. I, generally, I stick things in as I teach them. So as I get interested in, in, I can't teach a topic without knowing how the algorithm works myself, so I end up writing the tool, and it goes in, and a lot of the story of what's in there is, is a result of that. Uh, it is open uh, source software, but I want to take it a little bit further than that. I always say that White Box is actually an example of open access software. The idea here is perhaps you've heard about open access as being uh, something that is attributed to academic publishing, academic literature. Open source GIS is a fantastic idea. The problem that I see with it is the issue that, that um, we, we unfortunately haven't realized all of the proper benefits of it because the average end user is never going to engage with the software because of the various barriers that are involved in doing so. Uh, and so there's a certain education opportunity that's lost as a result. Open access software is software that's designed to reduce those barriers from the outset as part of the, the actual design principle of the software itself. So if you think about some of the barriers that the casual end user might have in order to figure out how a particular tool works, they have to, of course, uh, download the software, access the internet, they need to be able to open that source code itself in some kind of a, a, a visual studio or something like that, so access to that software. Then just figuring out the structure of a GIS, which is hundreds of thousands of lines of code, is an imposing barrier in itself, all to find the individual line or, or file that contains the 10 to 40 lines that make their tool that they're interested in work, then of course they need to know how to, how to interpret that. That's pretty tough to do. Uh, so white box, all of the 370 odd tools that are in there, you open up the tool, you get this sort of a dialogue, it has help on the side, but if you're really curious about how that algorithm works, as I usually am, then you press that view code button. And the view code button will then open up a box will show you those 10 to 40 lines of code that make that tool work. And that's open access software as opposed to open source software. And I think that's the future for uh, engaging a wider participation in, in open source GIS development. Who's using it? Not enough people to tell you the truth. Uh, a survey of the last 17 weeks of downloads has shown that there have been a little over 1,500 downloads of white box overall compared to something like G QGIS. I'm sure that's, that's really quite minimal. The other thing is the geographic spacing. So as you can see, North America, obviously I'm situated in Canada. There's a lot going on there, but not so much everywhere else, but particularly Africa has a disturbingly low participation in, in open source GIS overall. That's a known problem. 
might well be that, uh, that the language barrier, so perhaps if I had more than those 11 languages and some, some additional ones, that'd be good. Overall, about 91 countries have been used. I promised you I wouldn't go over, so I'm concluding, and as you can see, I have a really brief conclusion because I kind of figured I'd need to at this point. So here it is. Basically, white box is here. It's my goodie pack for you. It's open source. Go out. Everyone involved in spatial analysis probably is going to find something of interest for them in there. It's pretty extensive in terms of the various tools that are there. It is open source. In fact, I'm going to say it's open access. And the real benefit of open access is that just from an education point of view, if you want to know how something is working from a very intimate perspective rather than just reading and relying on what's in the help, you can actually, without having to impose all of those barriers, see what's going on. It's open source in the white box, transparent kind of way. That's it. So good.